So we're going to start with um, Beatrice Alain, who comes from uh, Le Chantier de l'Economie Sociale, the workshop of the social economy in Quebec, one of the best kept secrets in the world, at least the United States, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, she is the director of engagement and partnerships for the Chantier, and I'm just going to turn it over to her. Yeah, it's working. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, without further ado, uh, I think the purpose of this panel was to talk about a little bit what we're doing in each of our territories, but also sort of what we learned from that, because I think each territory has its own experience, its own dynamics, um, but there's things that we can, we can glean from each other to advance our own practices and our own realities. So I'm going to talk about the Quebec social economy system. For those of you for less familiar, Quebec is the province in Canada that's the Francophone, majority Francophone province. And really, it's very different for many regards to the rest of Canada. And the Chantier uh, is an organization that works throughout Quebec. Um, but, and we have partners in the rest of Canada. So, yeah. All right. So here are the key numbers for the social economy in Quebec. Uh, it's, it, I wrote approximately, it's actually more than 7,000 enterprises that provide more than 212,000 jobs. That may not seem like a lot, but there's not a lot of people in Quebec. So that's actually one job in 20 is in the social economy. Um, what's interesting is that, first of all, they're in all sectors, you know, they're in many sectors. So this is not one sector, one activity. It's a way of, uh, enter of, of running a business. Um, and if you look at the size of it, when I talk to this about people, they're like, oh, that's nice, a couple of people doing macrame in your, in your basement. No, the size of the social economy in Quebec in terms of economic impact is very big. I know that in St. Louis you have Boeing. In Quebec we have Bombardier, which is aeronautical. We talk about it all the time. The government subsidizes it massively. It's nothing compared to the social economy. And that's just the economic numbers. That doesn't account for the impact on social cohesion, human dignity, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so present in over 20 sectors, and really we're seeing those those growing as um, a lot of uh, changes, including numerical tools, um, but also the scale of operations are changing business models, viable business models. People are starting to think differently about how they want to build their enterprise, or young people coming out of universities are thinking, maybe I don't want to get a job in a big business, and maybe I don't want to have my own enterprise and have the weight and responsibility and the stress of that. So why don't we, a collective of engineering graduates, start our own worker co-op in engineering? Or why don't we have it in architecture? Or So we're seeing really more sectors that are being reinvented or retaken um, through this way of enterprising. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just have a parenthesis before that because I, I don't know, I guess I left it out. In um, Quebec, the social economy is defined as collective entrepreneurship. So it's co-ops, it's enterprising nonprofits. The common point here is that they're owned collectively, so they're managed collectively. That means they're accountable to the collectivity and their benefits are redistributed to members or to the community. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about how the scale of the social economy came uh, about. I think the main point is, is a moment of crisis. The first big, the, the, what are today very, very big co-ops in Quebec, um, namely uh, Desjardins, which is uh, credit union, and two big agricultural co-ops came about at the beginning of the 20th century because for the most part, Francophones were in rural areas and were poor. And so they weren't an interesting market for the English banks in Montreal. We're not interested in servicing them. So they came together and formed their own credit unions to service their members, to service each other, to come together. In the same way, the agricultural co-ops, there was a lot of small agricultural producers, and in the, in the crisis in the 30s, were, were struggling to survive. So they said, how can we band together and form basically a producer co-op of small farmers to be able to... Um, distribute their, their products and, and survive. Those three co-ops, there's two uh, agricultural co-ops in Desjardins, are huge, huge players. There's one of the, they're in the top 10 uh, employers in Quebec, those three. Um, so I think there's already a, a, this notion that when there's a crisis, people tend to think differently about how they're going to operate, sometimes just to survive. Um, another major crisis was in 96, um, right after the referendum to separate in Quebec, which was also in a context of an economic crisis. The government called a bunch of people together and said, okay, look, we have, um, 
we have a major economic crisis, how can we create jobs? What are your suggestions? We don't have a lot of money. And they created a, a temporary working group called the Chantier de l'économie. Chantier is a working site, mostly. And said a lot of, so brought together a lot of social actors with an economic impact and said, what do you think we can do to jumpstart job creation? And this led this conversation between actors from different sectors, including housing, neighborhood revitalization, the women's movement, um, community organizations, came together and said, okay, what are the needs that we have in our society? How can we support things that are very interesting but at a very small scale like parents run daycare or how can we create new services like home care that'll take people out of informality um, and that'll redistribute the benefit of servicing families that have more money and to ensure also services to people who have less money. So again the Chantier is born in a moment of crisis but people come together because they have to uh, think differently and create and becomes a permanent space to work together because all of those actors beyond their sector beyond their territory realize that together we can build tools that will serve all of us and we can get further. Um, I think another major point for Quebec was the moment for different reasons several key social actors became uh, adopted an economic posture. So for example the labor unions um, in Quebec 40% about of workers are unionized. So the labor unions are already important actors in, in the economy. But started to change their posture from, we're not gonna just negotiate the conditions in each plant over and over. How can we foster the development of an economy that serves workers more generally? So they created their, the two biggest union fund, unions, created each of them their pension fund. And those pension funds are supported by um, tax credits and in exchange invest uh, at least 60% of their funds in Quebec. And by investing in funds, and by investing in uh, local enterprises, they also force those enterprises to open their books, to have minimum standards in terms of their worker conditions. And But what that did over time, because those funds are now two billion and nine billion dollars, they're massive funds, um, is that the labor union now, the labor union representatives get invited to economic discussions about how do we want to invest and grow our economy. Or when projects are being big projects as much as little community projects, um, the labor unions can, can have a say, can support them or not support them because they have an economic tool at their disposal. So they're proactive and not just defensive. Um, the same way neighborhood development corporations that were built in a couple of neighborhoods in Montreal and in Quebec City in the 80s went from being a you know, food bank, help someone who's lost their job, try and find them somewhere to live, to hmm, how can we bring actors together to foster economic development in this community? So that's a, a, a subtle but I think important change in posture. And another one that I wanted to highlight is the, there was a big women's march in 96 where it was uh, bread and roses and so saying that not only do we need to look to the condition of women in Quebec, but we also need to foster economic development that's going to answer the needs of all women, where there's you know, decent work, where the conditions of work are, are acceptable, etc. So because all of these actors started to change their posture towards the economy from being in the defense or the palliative of one indication, of one aspect, to we want to work together with other actors working on the economy for a more equitable, sustainable model. We were able to build a bigger coalition and have inputs from different perspectives. And I think that was really important in terms of both coming up with the ideas of what we wanted to do, but also mobilizing collectively to obtain public policy. Thanks. So yeah, I was mentioning the Chantier de l'économie sociale comes out of that moment in 96. And really our core business is to bring people together both to promote the social economy, but also to develop it. Um, so on the board, we have different electoral colleges that'll regroup enterprises, sectoral networks, territorial networks, uh, social movements, et cetera. And the idea is to bring all these people together, not just to defend their interests, but so that collectively we can think about what we want to develop or what the current needs are and what is our strategy. So to promote the social economy, not just in and of itself, but as a tool for economic and social transformation, to create conditions and tools that facilitate the experimentation of new initiatives, the development of initiatives, and the consolidation of new sectors and projects, and to participate in the constructions of alliances, including internationally. And this is part of the reason why I'm here today. Yeah, 
Um, we talk a lot, we're starting to talk more and more about a balanced economy in Quebec. The point here is not to substitute public action. Um, in Quebec, we have a quite active government and we feel very strongly that they should continue to play a role to ensure accessible, equitable, basic services like water and education and health. Um, and the point is also not to say that there should be no more private initiatives. But first of all, there are a certain amount of things that necessarily are, are best looked at collectively, like cultural vitality, like local resource management need to be, um, the, the local community needs to have a say. And also what we're seeing is that in economies that are able to balance out where the, the public has a role, the private has a role, and the collective has an important role, those economies are generally more resilient. So this is some of the ecosystem that was, has emerged from this collective action around the chantier. As you can see, we have specific financial tools that invest in the social economy. They work with other financial tools like the labor pension funds, like government um, has an investment arm um, to support the creation and development of the social economy. We also have commercialization initiatives like uh, I buy the social economy, which are sort of engagement tools to engage local government and provincial government, but also a commercialization platform, like a sort of Amazon thing for the social economy, labor development structures, um, and knowledge transfer. So how can we find out good things that are happening in one place and get the information and best practice and facilitate the transfer elsewhere in other territories or other sectors? Um, so just to go back to the kinds of public policy, because that I think is the focus today, on the one hand, there's general public policy, like the City of Montreal had an action plan, so that meant coming together and saying, okay, what are your needs, City of Montreal? What are you interested in doing on your territory? And what are the capacities and needs of the social economy? How can we answer, help you answer those needs? And how can we work together? If you support us in this and this, we will be able to integrate people uh, who are having a difficulty uh, being integrated in the workforce or uh, need a home or et cetera. Um, and so that was a really interesting dialogue in finding mutual ground. Uh, the Quebec government has had several action plans and a framework legislation in 2013. Uh, the federal government is working on a social innovation strategy which should maybe come out next year, this year or next year. Who knows? But those are examples of sort of broad territorial, we want to show that we support the social economy. And those are really necessary to engage a discussion and also to not work in a silo, like the social economy is only to integrate marginalized people, or the social economy is only to provide food or housing or whatever, to say that the full potential of the social economy is to revitalize the territory. But you also need sectoral policies sometimes when there are specific needs or specific actors who are able to do much more with specific support. So for example, daycares, there were daycares uh, in Quebec that were being run by families had come together to provide daycare. We said this is really important and this will facilitate the re-entry at a moment where they were looking for um, more labor force. First of all, it facilitates the entry of women in the labor force if they have accessible daycare. Second of all, it integrates, it, the, the parents are the best ones to see whether the quality of the daycare offered is good or not. Um, and so by offering subsidized parent-run daycares all over Quebec, the, the, first of all, the presence of women in the labor force went way up, but second of all, the levels of poverty in single family, uh, single parent families went way down because those women, instead of staying at home on welfare, raising their kids, were able to put their kids in the daycare where that child has good meal and a socialization activities, and that person goes back to work as a productive member of society and with all of the advantages to them that that gives. Um, so the same thing, there's policies in housing, there's policy I was saying on home care that were developed, so to have home care services in each region of Quebec, and the logic again being if you just do that in poor neighborhoods, then you're putting the burden on the social economy to make a market out of a market where there's not really, you know, it's, it's very difficult, the margins are very small, but if you give a broader territory, they will service the communities that have more resources and those will pay full price and then they're able to offer, sub, you know, subsidies or reduce costs for families who wouldn't be able to do that. And that helps older people stay in their homes longer, um, in their community longer, not have to move to Montreal to an old person's residence, etc. And then there's population-specific policies. So, for example, worker integration enterprises that integrate people who are far from the labor market, like um, ex-convicts, people with um, substance abuse problems, et cetera. Adapted enterprises, which create permanent 
employment for um, handicapped people. Uh, there's a whole work around elderly care now because we have an elderly an aging population in Quebec. So how can different kinds of servicing, housing, leisure activities, home care work together to provide better services for this population regardless of their size of the community they live in or the, their economic means? So tell me if I'm using up too much time. Okay. Uh, some of the key lessons that come out of the Quebec experience, because beyond our experience, I think what's interesting is what other people can learn from this or, or take from this, takeaways. First of all, governance um, is really important. We, for, I think ownership matters a lot. And um, in Quebec, we've been talking about that a lot in terms of enterprises, but it's also true in terms of a movement. So we were able to do this because we were able to bring together, or because not we were able to bring, because a lot of different actors from different points of views were willing to work together to not just defend the right for housing or the right for food security, but the right for an economy that serves everyone. Um, secondly, a common identity. This is kind of an issue in the English world because there's so many words to talk about what's going on. Co-ops and new economy and just transition and social enterprise and community economic development and all of those are valid. But the problem is then it's hard to build a coalition when each person is talking about something and you're not really sure whether we're talking about the same thing. Uh, the creation of a shared space was important because we can talk amongst ourselves and agree on our common strategy and then mobilize private investments, government policies, etc. Alliances with social movements because we're not just defending our enterprises, but we're defending a transition, a change in, in paradigm. And so other groups out there, social justice groups, environmental groups, women's movements, um, are also interested in collaborating. We need to maintain those. And that, I'm not going to lie, that's a constant effort to maintain the pertinence of that and saying, we understand that you're working on environment and we're maybe not so key to that, but we have more to gain by working together than not. Um, combining sectoral and territorial focuses has also been really important because on the one hand, you need to have a broad umbrella, but you also need to be able to hone in on sectoral uh, advantages when you see them or opportunities when you see them. Um, and then I think international experience has been really enriching. Some of the things that were mentioned here were adapted to good practices that were happening elsewhere. The community development corporations that were created in Quebec in the 80s came from, in part from places like the Dudley Street Initiative in Boston that was really inspiring. The worker integration enterprises were adapted from good practices that were happening in France. Um, some of the new really exciting things that we're doing around building incubators in, in universities all over Quebec comes from practices that are uh, really interesting in Puebla. So we're always looking elsewhere to see what we can learn and then adapt to our own reality, our means and our, and our priorities. Um, yeah, a couple of last lessons. So dialogue, I think the co-construction of policy has been really important for us. And I think in this context, we can all agree that's a challenge when governments change and are not exactly in line with what we're really interested in. How do you keep that dialogue going? Um, our framework legislation was adopted unanimously, so all parties agree that the social economy has some importance. But then getting them beyond that, you need to talk to enterprise creation, or enter entrepreneurship, or cultural vitality, or integrating um, people with who are more marginalized. And so you need to adapt your discourse to whoever's in power in order to get their attention. This being said, all of the public policy that we have is great, but I think we also need to recognize that government's not really in it to transform the system. They're in it to stay in power. And so you, we also need to be realistic in what we can get for them and both be willing and able to mobilize and to pressure, to apply pressure and say this needs to happen because all of us agree that this is gonna happen, but then also be strategic in, in proposing things that is gonna actually advance those governments in place. Um, it's also a slow process and it evolves and there's steps forward and steps backwards. And I think we need to look at these crises that we're facing, which are very clear and, and devastating in some cases, as opportunities because I think the realization that the model that we're in is not sustainable and that we need to think differently about how we're engaging our resources, how we're developing our communities. Um, it, I think everyone agrees on that. We just need to find, come together and find new ways that are more accountable, more sustainable, more equitable. And I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Beatrice. Really informative.
Uh, just a little housekeeping. I think we'll hold off on questions until everyone has spoken to make sure that we, everyone has enough time to present. Um, our next speaker is Aristarco Cortez from the U Universidad Iber Iberoamericana de Puebla. Uh, both, uh, all of us, Beatriz, Rafael, and I have had the opportunity to visit in Puebla, and it's truly an amazing place in terms of what they're doing with regard to social economy. They have a master's program and many, many innovative uh, forms of working with the community, which we'll hear about. Um, Aristarco is the head of the, um, design, of the Institute of Design and Innovative Technology, which is a leading actor in the social economy in Puebla. And I just want to mention that we have to give him a special hero of the Social Economy Award at the end of this panel because in about 25 minutes, the Mexico soccer game in the World Cup is going to, is going to start with Korea, and he's here. So, at least for the moment, he's here. So thank you, Aristarco. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, you to share our experience with the uh, social uh, economy enterprises in the, the, the work that we are doing in, in Puebla. Well, Puebla, uh, Puebla, is about, uh, Puebla City is about an hour and a half uh, from Mexico City in the way to the Gulf, to the east. Um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful city. It's a, um, if you have the opportunity to, to go, you, you, will, you will be surprised of, uh, of our 500-year-old um, city. Uh, Puebla is the uh, municipality with the, the biggest number of poor people in Mexico. But on the other hand, is the place where more luxury cars are sold in the country. So there, there, there is, a, there is a, the, the context that uh, we are in. We have a... Um, I come from a Jesuit university. There are seven Jesuit universities in, in Mexico. And uh, I come from uh, this place. It's called IDIT, uh, the Design and Technology Institute of a uh, university. All the labs of the university are there, but we also use the same infrastructure to give services to the public. It's, uh, it's a place, probably it's the biggest, oops, probably it's the biggest uh, maker space in the world, uh, 90,000 square uh, feet. Um, we are an open innovation center. Uh, we are open to the public. Uh, every week, more than 6,000 people goes in to, 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 to do something at, um, at EDIT. And we developed this social economy enterprises um, program. We started at the university in 2010. Uh, we started the, the master degrees in uh, co-ops. Uh, with, with the help with uh, Mondragon University. Mondragon is the, one of the biggest uh, cooperative groups in, in the world. It's an, an, an Spanish uh, venture. At 2013, we started with our own methodology uh, it, at the institute. By 2015, we created the Laboratory of uh, Social and Economic Innovation. And we started, um, we started to work in 2014 with um, international funding to work with companies uh, inside the, um, the Puebla municipality that uh, draw attention from the Puebla municipality government. And uh, we started the program in 2016, uh, by the end of 2016, 2017 and 18, working with, um, with the government in uh, 10 regions in, in Puebla. Uh, why a technology and design centers holds a social innovation lab? Uh, because, well, first we have the mandate from the president of our university that he, he told us that uh, we should not work only for big companies because uh, in Puebla there's the, this huge uh, Volkswagen manufacturing plant from it has 50 years there, and uh, it sucks all the resources from universities. And he told us that you have to work uh, with the people and outside the university. We have to help the most in, in, in need. And we had this hypothesis that the cooperative model makes uh, more resilient uh, enterprises, initiatives. And the second, that a uh, small company in the base of the pyramid, if you help them with uh, technology, uh, they will have uh, much more uh, opportunities in the market uh, with this aid. So we started to do uh, things at the social, um, social uh, innovation. We, we started with an incubator. Um, 
We, we already have helped 670 uh, companies. We build this uh, methodology. We had this social uh, digital fabrication plus social uh, economy. We are a fab lab. We work as a fab lab. Well, of course, a fab lab with steroids because we are very, very big. Uh, we are open to the public. We started to make uh, uh, programs to help artisans, artists, um, to, to enter the digital fabrication um, knowledge. And uh, then we started the social um, economic uh, innovation lab. We are working, uh, we started in Puebla, now we are working with uh, funding from uh, uh, Fundación Carlos Slim and USAID uh, funds. We're working in eight states in uh, Mexico, mainly in the border with the, um, with the US and uh, specifically to, um, to help people in, in violent zones, especially young people. Uh, well, social economic enterprises, uh, we think of them as co-ops, co what you call co-ops, and for-profit uh, co-ops. Our, our model, I'm, I'm gonna explain a little bit the, the, the model, how it works, and then how we are working with the Puebla municipality as a, as a public uh, policy. Uh, well, our model has four, four legs. We work on the team, we work on innovation, on the part of the business and networking. And on a um, like kind of a second level, we work with, with commercialization, consumption, production, and uh, savings. <clears throat> well, we, the, the, the most important part of our model is the team building. I mean, uh, we, you can have a great idea, but if you don't have a good team, it, uh, that idea is going to die. I mean, uh, a bad idea with a good team, the good team, uh, they, they're going to find uh, a, a better idea in, in time. So we work a lot of uh, building the, the team. In the business, regarding the business area, we, well, we teach them uh, everything that a normal incubator will teach. Um, sales, costs, uh, finance, uh, production, all, all that stuff. Uh, networking is working with them, uh, not only as a company, but uh, a series of companies. So, so we put them uh, in contact, we put them uh, together to find uh, new opportunities for, for, every, for every company. And on the innovation side, uh, these, these companies in the base of the pyramid, they don't, they don't need um, aerospace technology, they, they need very basic things, and we help them with the uh, university, with the students, with the fab lab, to develop pro uh, products, to, to, to develop um, uh, uh, plant layout and, and, and 5S. So the, the route is in, in the business, from a business idea to a profitable business, in a team from individuals to an aligned and integrated uh, team, innovation, they go from ideas to uh, innovative businesses and networking from individual businesses to uh, cooperative uh, allies. On the first level we work with, at first we work uh, with individual needs that becomes a collective need of a group, then we talk them to, uh, to them to become a, a team and then an efficient and um, profitable enterprise or uh, organization. And on the second level, as, as, as I told you, uh, we work with all these organizations and find out uh, some common needs that could be uh, that the, the group of groups can can, can solve. Uh, this is um, how we work. We have a, a project manager. We have a social economy enterprises coaches and promoters. The coaches goes directly with the companies. <clears throat> every week they have a, this meeting with every, every single company. They, they are working with. Uh, they can handle between 10 and 15 companies, it depends on the, on the, on the size of the, of the group. The promoters see the relation between all these companies. They, they work on savings, production, consumption, innovation, and commercialization. And we also use a lot of students. Uh, last year we used around 100, well we used, uh, <laughs> students helped us, um, uh, there were about 117 students from different universities. In Mexico, uh, if you want to get your degree, you have to make uh, 450 hours of social service, and they are doing that with, uh, with, with, with us. 
and that's how we arrived to Yocom Pro Poblano. It's uh, well, the mayor saw what we were doing with international funding, and, uh, and he was interested in working in 10 areas of Puebla where the, the highest uh, poverty and violence uh, levels in the in the city. Uh, it's called Yocom Pro Poblano. It's kind of I buy locally. It's the first uh, project institutionalized as a public policy. They even uh, changed the, the, the government structure and they added a, a director of social economy in Puebla municipality to handle this, uh, this, this, this program. And they encourage in entrepreneurship, uh, improved creativity, generating added value. So, that's how, how we started, the interest of Puebla and our experience. By 2017, we, we, we helped uh, 296 companies. We started with 325, about 20% of, uh, uh, of them uh, quit. Our goal was 250, so <clears throat> we were uh, above uh, expectations. Uh, this year, we're working with 316 companies in, in these uh, areas. So it's an incubation uh, uh, business initiative, uh, access to innovation and production of social economy. <clears throat> That's uh, it's a 12-month 12, 12 program. We started with a uh, team building. Uh, we, we we trained around uh, 40 people in social economy and what the, the roles of coaching and the roles of uh, promoter. <clears throat> we, we've been assigned the the, the zone. Um, we had to go, but the. Um, we went as a university to find these initiatives in these areas, not as a government, that, that, that is important. In Mexico, people are not, um, they do not trust very much our government. Uh, I think it's different in the US. <laughs> <clears throat> so it, it was easier to go as a Ibero University, a Jesuit university, to go into the territory than going the, as a government. Also, if you go as government, people, people will, will ask you for money. And the first thing we, we, we told the people is we don't have money. We have this program, but we don't have uh, money right now. And uh, it helped us to, to get better companies that, that, that were people that wanted to work and, and not people that wanted money. Well, we, we did the field work. Uh, we started incubation, and we have several diagnoses. Um, in 2017, uh, we saw 294 uh, companies that ended the incubation process. There were involved uh, over 1,500 um, employment. Uh, almost 40% of all these companies were new ventures, so it, they were incubated in the, in the process. 75% uh, of them increases sales. Uh, almost 60% increases pro pro uh, profits. Um, well, I can see the... the a large percentage. A large percentage. <laughs> and we also uh, measure the, the, the group metrics um, because it, the group is important for us. The, 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 the social involvement in all this initiative is, uh, is important and, uh, for us. So how they distribute money, how they take decisions, how, uh, um, how they solve the needs. I mean, it, it, it is very, very important for, for us. So we have metrics regarding to the group. Uh, the, the, this was, um, we started to, the, um, the government, the, the important thing for the government are numbers. Uh, our mayor and the secretary of the, the, uh, economic development are economists, so, so they want to see numbers. Um, well, I, we have a very, very good mayor. I have to say that he's he's a very intelligent, he's very, very proactive. Unfortunately, he's leaving the office this year. Uh, well, for 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 every peso invested in the program, uh, there, there were sales for three three point three times the the, the invested. But these are. Um, from April to December, if, uh, in only 200 companies. If we take that to 300 companies and we make a, a yearly pro uh, projection, it is about 60 million pesos. Uh, I mean, for every peso invested in, by the government, um, the, the, the companies sell 
six times the, the, that investment. And uh, th there's another number that I don't have here, but it's very, very interesting because uh, we just have uh, this Audi plant investment in uh, Puebla, and the government uh, spent almost 8 million pesos per job created in, in this auto industry that everybody loves. Uh, it was one job, eight million pesos. Um, in this program, for every job, the government invests 6,000 pesos. So that, that, that's the, the, a huge difference. Um, and this, this, these jobs are created in the most, um, the biggest, where the, the biggest poverty levels are and uh, violence levels. Well, um, well the, the, another thing that is, is important for us because um, since we are a technology institute, is how innovation is permeated to these uh, companies. So through the Fab Lab, we, we made uh, 71 workshops. We, we had um, over 1,700 uh, participants, and uh, we, we accompanied 206 um, companies. There are many things we, 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 did, we did with, uh, with companies, not only um, we had some 5S layout. We trained them in digital fabrication. We helped them with uh, um, nutrition facts, uh, with uh, manufacturing parameters of the products. We helped them uh, with uh, new products, with a lot of stuff, um, mainly with the aid of, uh, of our students. Well, the impact is that um, they have uh, better products, they increased innovation, they increased uh, digital, they use digital fabrication. So these uh, new um, technologies are permeating in this, uh, in these ventures. Well, th there's, <clears throat> this is a very, this is very interesting. We're, okay, we're, this is a store. The, the government, actually we, we execute the entire program. And the, and, and the Puebla government is like in, in, in a second level, just watching us uh, executing and helping us. Faci they, they facilitate uh, several actions in regarding to the to the to the program. They help us to connect with local leaderships to ease the field access. They help us to access local malls. Actually, this is a, a, a local mall, a, a very fancy mall that uh, all these companies will will never have access to a, to a place like this without the, the, the help of the, of the program. They promote government purchases to companies in the project. I mean, all um, Christmas gifts, all teacher days, mother day, all, uh, many of, of, the, of the things that the government buys, they buy from, from, from locally from Puebla. It's kind of a social clause to the, to the uh, government purchases. So th that is helping the companies because th their main problem is that they cannot sell, 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 sell. what they uh, produce. So the government helps with that. The universities helps with that. We also at the university, uh, we have this relation of Yo Compro Poblano people and the university buys from these, uh, from these people. So they are starting to, 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 to grow very, very fast. Some of them, even faster than they should, but I mean, um, they serve as an uh, ally to accessing local uh, commerce chambers and industrial chambers. So we have companies that we call tractor enterprises. So there are big companies that are purchasing things. Uh, for example, uh, we access the um, tourism uh, chamber and the hotels are buying soaps, are buying uh, jellies, are buying the, the, some textiles for their hotels out of Yo Compro Poblano. And that, that was thanks to the government help that eased this relation with, uh, with, the bigger, with bigger companies. They give us a visibility of the project through their communication channels and social networks. Um, they serve as an intermediary to reach other funding in institutions. They help us with the federal government. Actually, we are going to start um, a new venture out of uh, Jocompro Poblano. That's a business social economy uh, enterprises accelerator. Because we, we have, as, as I told you, we have these companies that are growing 
uh, uh, very, very fast, even faster than they can grow, and they are starting to have problems with uh, financials and, and with, with the size of the, they don't know how to, how to grow. We have companies that in three years and a half, four years, they, are, they have started uh, exporting to Central America. They, they, they are growing. I mean, some of the companies, you can see that in, in four or five months, they increase their sales by 65, 70%, and they, they want to, to build new products, and it's, it's been a, a very interesting journey regarding that, that point. Um, they gave us international visibility, and of course, they, um, they funded the, the, the project. <clears throat> and, and another example is very interesting with uh, one of the programs that we had that we, uh, we, we teach um, artisans and artists that digital fabrication we have two very, very, very nice success stories. One of the, that is uh, Fab Lab Analco. It's a group of artisans, actually a cooperative. They organize as a, a co-op. And uh, the Puebla government, the city government, helped us to fund a new Fab Lab for them. And they are in uh, downtown uh, Puebla. And they are teaching other artisans to, to how to work with this um, with these tools, and it's been very, very successful. If, if you see the products that they were ma uh, making before and after the process, you will be amazed, totally uh, amazed by that. Um, oh. uh, okay. Well, we have learned, well, um, it's a, a very successful model for participation among public entities, private and educational uh, institutions, and civil society. The values of and principles of social economy have permeated beyond the, the, the business environment. The people are starting to talk with uh, about the, the, the project and the values of uh, social uh, economy. Uh, it, it was very interesting that the 2017, it was hard to make people understand what we wanted to, to do in, in these uh, neighborhoods. Uh, but by for the second year, we had a, a waiting line, you know, for for people that wanted to go into the, the, the program. Uh, so so it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, the, the work by zones uh, was very, uh, very important. The, the, this territorial, uh, territorial uh, organization, community development and identity, it's, uh, it's, it's very important in the, in the, in the project. We, 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 never, we never thought this, this part at, at the beginning of the, of the project. Uh, well, we've, we, the, 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 the secretary, politically it's very important for them because uh, the, the project has has taken the, the politics to to other places to to talk about their their success, uh, and, and and that that is very important for us because they are happy with the with the project, so, and, and they they will keep uh, funding. Uh, now the model is being replied in uh, eight states, and, and the um, the social and economic laboratory is doing many other things. We, we build the national youth uh, social economy enterprise model in the Mexican Institute for the Youth. We, are, we, we build the, the, the model and uh, we, we're being asked to, to help uh, some other institutions in the federal government. Uh, we are, we're changing government uh, this year, and, but we do believe that the, uh, the, 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 the program will will still be in progress for, for next uh, years. And well, we are working with other municipalities. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Aristarco, that was really interesting. Um, and I recommend that people try to visit Puebla if possible. One, one thing I want to point out is that Aristarco mentioned in the beginning the important role that Mondragon played in helping them get started. Well, that type of cooperation is absolutely essential because I can assure you, among the groups up here, there's been a lot of exchange in which there's, it's been inspiring in terms of a two-way exchange in which each group is gathering something of value from the other. And that's really important in moving forward this concept of social economy. Um, so that's great. This um, session is being uh, taped, by the way, so it will be available, I guess, on the internet through the uh, NEC um, website. But also, um, 
I think I can say, unless anyone objects, that these um, uh, PowerPoint presentations can be available also if you'd like to get a copy. So maybe leave a card with us and we'll make sure you get a copy. Is that okay, Aristarco? Yeah, it's, uh, of okay. course. I, w I would like to add something uh, about the, what we were saying about Mondragon. We also have help from uh, Le Chantier, of course. We, we, we interchange a lot of knowledge and, uh, with the uh, Andalusia School of uh, Social Economy. But it, and, and it's very, I think it's crucial not to start from zero, to, to see other, um, other people has, that has done this, has, has walked this path and uh, work with them. It, it eases the, the, the way. The, the and I, I would just add that while they're not here on the stage, there is a very strong relationship between all of us and the School of Social Enterprise in um, Andalusia. And they're invaluable players with us. I mean, in the case of Cuba, we have taken delegations uh, to courses and trainings in Puebla and in um, Andalusia, and it's, it's really been invaluable and exchanged a lot with the Chantier as well. Do you want to add? I just want to add that another really interesting hotbed of development of the social economy right now is in Seoul, South Korea. So it's a little touchy to be following this soccer game because <laughs> we have partners in both countries that we work a lot with. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Rafael Betancourt, and um, he's known sort of as our man in Havana. Rafael is, is Cuban, um, but you'll notice from his English accent that he speaks rather good English. Um, Rafael and I, and I have worked together for about six years now, um, and there's really no one more informed about the social economy in Cuba than Rafael. He's recently edited a book called uh, Socialism from the, the Grassroots, um, and he's a professor at the Colegio San Jerónimo, which is associated with the University of Havana. So, Rafael? Oh, wait, wait. He's also a New Economy Common Bound star since he's been to two others and he was in the main plenary session. Was it last year in Buffalo? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Buenos dias. <clears throat> I was um, reading this very good two-page uh, spread on what is the new economy in the program. And I started to think of the things that, that are included and the things that are not. One of the things that's interesting is the question of language and terminology. So we've been speaking about new economy, social economy, solidarity economy, and I would introduce socialist economy. Because in Cuba we have a socialist economy. So in a way, we began in 1959 to implement the new economy as a system, and we've been doing it for 60 years. So in, in terms of at least of the, of the basic premise that uh, a new economy must work for all people, starting with those who have been historically marginalized and exploited, well, we have basically 60 years of experience in developing this new economy and in developing it within a, a, a national and, and systemic uh, socialist economy. So, uh, but there are a bunch of missing pieces. And before I get to that, I want to talk about what is not dealt with um, openly, or I, I would say specifically in this, and that is what is the new economy or the social and solidarity economy about? Is it about reforming capitalism or is it about replacing capitalism? So I think we would have in, in, in this uh, forum a lot of opinions with respect to that. So when you apply this to Cuba, is the new economy or the social and solidarity economy meant to uh, reform or strengthen socialism, or is it meant to introduce a benign capitalism and sort of move in the direction of a nice, you know, everybody likes capitalism, right? And I think that that's a discussion that we are having in Cuba today. Some authorities, some people that don't like us to talk about social and solidarity economy believe that we are sneaking in this benign capitalism. And while some of the, are the, those of us who are activists in Cuba for the social and solidarity economy see it precisely as a way to improve, to strengthen socialism, not to uh, get rid of it. 
So what are the missing pieces then? I think that the, the two parts here that are very important are the sustainability and the democracy components of the new economy. In terms of sustainability, we have had an economy, a socialist economy, that has had been struggling for 60 years. And not uh, a big, I mean, a big part of that reason for the struggle has to do with the uh, US blockade, which in this case of Trump, it's not on the internet, it's the real blockade. It's back to the, uh, uh, the, the aggressive policies of the United States to deny economic development to Cuba. So one of the big differences that we have with Mexico, with, with uh, uh, Canada or Quebec, uh, and with the U.S. is that we don't have any money. So it's very difficult to implement uh, economic changes or new economic models or introduce innovation when you don't have money to fund it. And not even the funders that uh, support some of these uh, projects, they're not there for many different reasons. And a lot of it has to do with our own incapacity to develop the economy or to introduce the changes that are necessary to uh, take it to a new stage. And this has to do with the, 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 the changes that have been taking place since 2010 and particularly 2014 with the introduction basically of the market system of, of the private sector which today represents about 30% of the labor force, and it, and it is a, a, a presence in the, in the economy and in the society that the government is un uncomfortable with and has been uncomfortable with. The same thing with respect to uh, uh, cooperatives, because until, nine, until 2014, the only cooperatives that existed in Cuba were agricultural workers' cooperatives. And this was actually in the Constitution. So the, so the experiment with the urban or industrial and service cooperatives, always workers' cooperatives, not in any other area, began only in 2014. And it's had its ups and downs. So this, this situation is changing the nature of the society and the nature of the economy. We now have a greater income and wealth uh, inequality as a result of the emergence of, 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 an, of, a, of a market system, even though it's small, but it's already introducing those changes. And it has to do not with salaries, but it has to do with access to hard currency. So we go back to the problem of no money, and those who have a little money are in a privileged position to open a restaurant or to open a, a, a BMB, et cetera, et cetera. So the other missing pieces would be, uh, first of all, money, the resources, and the definition of the role of the private sector uh, within the society, what does it, how does it play within the socialist economy, within the socialist system, how to deal with emerging uh, inequalities. And the other thing is the role of civil society. So we have a, a civil society defined very much by the state and by the uh, opportunities or spaces that the state opens up. So there's, there's uh, very little uh, so far, space to organize, create, and, and, and mobilize around grassroots issues. And this has to do with the third concept, which is the concept of democracy. So if we talk about the, 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 the Cuban socialist revolution, the socialist model, it definitely uh, contributed to democratizing the society. Uh, and, and it has done so in many, many ways. And I'll show you a little bit of an example in a minute. But the question is, how does that democracy work? And it has worked from the top down. For 60 years, it has worked from the top down. It has a lot to do with the, the role of Fidel Castro, his leadership position, which as in everything has its yin and has its yang. And the yang of it is that uh, there has been uh, a, 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 a not enough space to, to grow and to uh, de uh, organize from the grassroots. So we are now emerging in this new concept of, of new economy or social and solidarity economy a, uh, has very much to do with the concept of decentralization and local government and local power, and, uh, and including the fi financing municipalities, but it has a lot to do with devolving power from the central government and from the central uh, apparatus to the localities and to the municipalities. So 
I want to just tell you a little bit of where we're at now. So we have just elected a new president. This is the first time we have a president that was born uh, in the, in, within the period of the revolution. And so we have a, a, a change in, in, um, in uh, a generational change. It's not a, a system change, but it's a change within the system that is very important. And that we don't know where it's going, really. There is a lot of speculation, hopes. Uh, I, I particularly am very optimistic, but I think that there is a lot of uncertainty as well. We have elected a new president, and we have elected a new uh, National Assembly, which is the governing body. This National Assembly is, is very interesting. Uh, 30, it has 53% women. It's the second uh, assembly in the world with most women uh, members. 41% are people of color, blacks and mestizos. 86% are university graduates. So these are things that symbolize our strengths and then also our weaknesses. 63% of them live and work in the municipality which they represent. And the average age is 49. Now, this is the other side. Private workers, as I said, constitute about 30% of the labor force. They constitute 0.5% of the delegates to the National Assembly. And there are no delegates from the non-agricultural or private or um, urban cooperatives. So the representation of this new emerging sector is not there. At least it's not there in the National Assembly and it represents a little bit the mentality, the situation we're at. What is the future? in terms of uh, a, a new, let's say, a new economy in the sense of empowering the local sector, the emerging private sector with a socialist. I always say that the Cubans, after six years, we have socialism in our, in our DNA. So if you, small, if you start a small business, you start it with a, 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 with a, a spirit of solidarity to your family, towards your neighborhood, because it's already there. The problem becomes when you discard that and you say, no, I'm here to make money and I don't care about the social issues. That's a problem of the state. It's their problem, not mine. And unless you nurture the social economy in the new sectors and in the society at large, you are going to have that. You're going to have a divorce. Yeah, socialism is nice as long as the government does it, but we are going to pursue our own individual and, and, and profit gains. So I think that that's our challenge. That's our moment where we're at. And, <clears throat> and it has also to do with empowering local governments to assume the social economy as part of their model of local development. And while we're here, it's because we have a lot to learn from experiences, concrete experiences uh, of Quebec, of Mexico, of the United States that are applicable. I, I, I'm going to take as a task taking this here and translating each one, not translating the language, translating the concept of these workshops. How would I do a workshop on strategies for reclaiming land for communities in Cuba? Well, I would look at the problem of land use and the amount of land that is, that is not being farmed, which has already been for the last few years an issue and a topic that's been, that the government has been working on, redistributing uh, unused land, unused agricultural land to uh, emerging farmers, to new farmers. But what about the urban land? What about the, 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 the um, amount of, of uh, open spaces that are not being used, that are in some state companies' hands and are not being put to use. Well, why can't we use that for an urban cooperative? Why can't we use that for a social project? So I would do a lot of things like this and I would say, how could I translate that into our needs, into our possibilities, and to our potential? Because social and solidarity economy, when we were here six years ago, we had Ecuador, here, we had Argentina here, we had Brazil here, and where are they now? They're struggling to survive, just to survive in a neoliberal environment. And we're still here, Cuba is still here, the socialist system is still here, it's, it's going forward despite all the obstacles, so it's a matter now of making it better and continuing to see ourselves as a potential model for the future, for the third world, because there are very few other options as a system. But in terms of the things that can be innovated, that can be introduced, that examples that we can apply, 
God, this is why we're all here together. Thank you. Well, well put. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I'd like to put in a plug for the next workshop coming up with our Puerto Rican compañeros. They'll be starting at, I guess, 1030. Um, I hope, encourage you all to attend. I know we will. Um, so I'm not sure how we're going to do this with the recording uh, in terms of getting the questions on. Maybe you can ask the question and we'll repeat it into the microphone so that it gets recorded. Or I don't know, maybe in the back you can, we can pass a microphone. Okay. All right. Does anyone have a question? And if it's a specific person you're directing it to, just let us know. Okay. Beatrice is suggesting take two or three questions at a time and then they'll be answered. Any, any show of hands of people interested? Oh, yeah. Okay. You'll take care of that, Eli? Thank you. Um, the thing that I've always been interested in about Quebec is the number of multi-stakeholder cooperatives that have developed there, which are very difficult to do here. We have maybe one or two that are relatively successful. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the multi-stakeholder cooperative idea and how it's been implemented, how the conflicting producer, consumer, worker, interests get resolved in a multi-stakeholder. Uh, John Root, Just Abundance. So you, you want us to take a couple of questions? I, I just feel like it's kind of fairer that way because yes, sometimes we I agree. get too much into one question and other people don't get time. Great. Um, so this question is uh, initially directed to Beatrice and then uh, expanded to the rest of the panel as well. Um, I was just checking out the um, Chantier website, um, Mike Strode, Cold Nut Collaborative, Chicago, Illinois. Um, so I was checking out the Chantier website and looking at the youth wing and the youth network, and I'm really interested in strategies for how um, we are refreshing the generations in terms of, you know, how we cultivate social and solidarity economies. So uh, certainly the youth wing looks like it extends to sort of 35 and, and and uh, you know, around that of those ages, but you know, just going further and further down into the generations, so that you know, we inculcate this into further generations um, uh, younger than that. Thank you, Mike Samuel, New Economy Project. Um, this is a question for Senor Cortez. Um, I'm so fascinated about the number of co-ops you're incubating every year. You know, we were in New York City, we went from, in five years, 20 worker cooperatives to 80 worker cooperatives, and everyone is really excited about that. It's a huge accomplishment. You're talking about 300 a year, um, and the connection to the Fab Lab is so interesting. So I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what do these cooperatives look like? Are they, are they mostly in manufacturing? How many people are they? Um, how, do you, how are people feeling about sort of the sustainability of these enterprises? Just a little bit more of a snapshot of what, what I can only imagine is a very rapidly growing ecosystem of cooperatives, like at a pace that is, is sort of hard for us to imagine in the States. Are we good? Am I starting on that? Um, so maybe just to speak quickly on the multi-stakeholder cooperatives, yeah, those are the, in terms of the numbers of cooperatives that are uh, being created every year in Quebec, the most, the one, the model with the most co-ops are the multi-stakeholder co-ops. And I think that reflects, uh, well, first of all, for small communities, often there's an issue of ensuring basic local services. So if you have to drive half an hour to buy a pint of milk, Maybe it we, and you're too small for a private business to want to have a general store. You come together as a community to create that common store, which is also an internet point, which is also a gas station, which is also, uh, and those kind of basic needs or sometimes aspirations of a community are not just a question of me as a worker or me as us as producers of one product, but it's really everyone. There's people working to ensure those services. There's people consuming those services. There's people who support those services, regardless of whether I want to 
buy milk there, the fact that there is that local store means me as a local business, I can hire new employees and they know that they have a quality of life because there's daycares, because there's you know banking services, etc. So I think it really is rooted around this idea of this community coming together as opposed to just a single silo worker co-ops. I mean, worker co-ops are impressive, and I think producer co-ops had their use in their time. But I think this, this notion of, it's a, we have to think about it more broadly as how we're serving the community. And in that sense, I think they're closer, it's sort of a co-op version of an enterprising nonprofit where you have a board that represents different kinds of users, but really the mission is to serve the community, not just a certain specific finite set of users, of players. Um, and to answer your question about uh, young people, the youth wing, we've been thinking about this, and there's a generational shift in the social economy um, in Quebec already underway. A lot of people within the organizations, and now we're seeing in the directions of the organizers, the, the directors are retiring. So already, sort of like what you were saying with the revolution, how all these networks and initiatives that were built up from this one generation, that generation is retiring. How do you transmit the, the, the knowledge, the culture, the, the, what worked, what didn't? Um, on the one hand, you have people who are much more trained or coming out of business schools who are working in these enterprises, so there's a, le a degree of professionalization that's much better. On the other hand, there's less of a knowledge of the history of the movement and the struggles. Um, so I think that's, in general, a, uh, an interesting process. But I think the hopes for the youth wing is to, for example, say when we're looking at like platform co-ops, there's a couple of numerical initiatives in the social economy that are very promising, but we're not able right now to speak to all of the people around a free software or open data who have the same values as us, but they're not talking about the social economy. And so the hope is that through initiatives like the Youth Wing, they're, where they're able to mobilize or speak to other young people engaged in environmental issues or whatever it is, and, and to come back to us and say, these are the concerns, here are the issues that we can work with them on, or here's the way to frame that language in order to engage young people. And also to challenge our board and say, it's nice that you're talking about whatever, but the issue for young people is access to housing or access to land in the rural areas, or the digital issue is real and we, want, we should be working in this field just because the old traditional existing sectors aren't thinking about their digital strategy or developing social economy in the digital field doesn't mean it's not a major issue in society and for young people. So it, the hope is that they challenge us and the, the, the objective is to outreach in a very different way. Regarding to the to the companies that we work, with, we have uh, 300 initiatives. Um, we also were surprised because uh, on the, um, that going into the field and finding uh, so many people that are doing things in their homes. I mean, there are small manufacturing facilities in in many homes, and uh, they are not open to the public. They are not open to IRS. They are not, you know, they, they are kind of. Um, Hidden uh, underground. underground businesses, um, uh, yeah, th there are survival techniques in, in these uh, very, very very poor uh, areas. But also, there's a tradition of manufacturing in in, in Puebla. You know, the the um, the first manufacturing plant in Latin America was installed in Puebla, and there there's been uh, the, this this craft tradition in 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 Puebla. Um, the other thing is that um, there, there are many sectors there, are the, mainly uh, a lot of uh, food companies, uh, not, not only, uh, there are some restaurants and, and some catering companies, but uh, mainly they, they produce uh, a thing called mole, it's a, a traditional local, very good <laughs> food. Um, and, and several other things uh, regarding to, to, to food, maybe transformation to uh, food transformation. Maybe it's about 26 to 30 percent of the of the companies. But we have uh, companies of a lot of things. We didn't know that uh, Puebla produced a lot of jewelry, and we found out that, that there were a lot of people um, making uh, jewelry, and. It, 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 it was fortunate because uh, at the uh, edit we have this jewelry um, lab, and we have helped them to to make better jewel, jewelry, to build 3D, to 
print 3D models in wax to make their own models to lost wax techniques. Uh, the, the, we, we, our, um, our lab is open to the public. So in, in, the, in the food processing, we, we have several companies that goes in, on a Saturday or on a Friday where, where, where there are no classes in, in, the, in our pilot plant uh, for food production and they they produce the, a month they, they make a month production in our facilities and they go out and sell the, their their stuff so that way they are starting to grow using our facilities or well, renting our facilities to do this 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 thing um, the the number of uh, people it's uh, we work with at least three people per initiative but the average is five people per uh, initiative I, I think we're going to need to wrap it up here. It's 10:25, and we don't want to take away time from the next panels as people you know, move around. Um, I just want to tell one story about Puebla, which really impressed me, was that up until the time of the opening of the Fab Lab, that Puebla had this, you know, it's, it's a very strong tourist attraction as a city. So a lot of the souvenirs, quote unquote, that are being sold are imported from China and you can imagine where else. The point being that there is a strong tradition of artisanship in Puebla, but for the artisans to really get the value, be paid adequately for the amount of time they're putting into really quality production, you know, it makes it a fairly expensive proposition that's not affordable for a lot of tourists who come. Well, what I learned, and Aristarco can correct me if I'm wrong, is the creation of the Fab Lab gave artists, artisans, the cap capacity of designing things and, pr and printing them much faster, which brought down the cost and helped revive local artisanship as opposed to importing fake Mexican you know, souvenirs. So this is a great example in my mind of how this kind of process can really have an impact on the local economy and really empower a large number of people who can then work cooperatively around that. So again, do you want to add something? Yeah, many people are against using a fab lab and technology on artisan, uh, but uh, what technology does, they, they take take out the, the non-value added um, operations uh, regarding to, to crafting. No? So, so that gives them time to design, gives them time to sales, give them time to, to marketing, and uh, give them uh, some other opportunities. We have the case of uh, uh, an artist in, in Puebla that he, he makes scaled models of buildings and uh, cities, and now we are building, we are helping him to build the uh, Querétaro, the city of Querétaro scale model. It's a almost 500 square feet uh, scale model in, um, in metal, and uh, we're helping him to, he, he learned with us digital fabrication, and he knew what the machines were capable of doing, and uh, he came with us and, well, I have the contract, we have to build it in two months, <laughs> And uh, now we are designing all the 3D models of the city, and we are using the CNC router to make the city. And, and then he takes that CNC router uh, models, and he's doing his thing with the uh, metal and with bronze. And okay. Well, thank you all in the audience. Thank you, panelists. And we're ending on a note, uh, just for Aristarco's benefit. Mexico is winning 1-0 after tw at 28 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>